Welcome back, everyone. Um, today we're going to be taking a look at one of the most classic electric guitar effects there is, and that is the wah pedal. In our last video, we looked at the color sound wah, which is an inductorless design, but today we're going to take a look at the classic wah pedal that uses an inductor. And so we're going to be looking at the Vox wah. Vox made the original wah pedal um, way back in the 60s, I believe it was. Um, and it was actually made to try and mimic the sound of a trumpet player using a mute. Um, but um, it has become its own effect and it has been popularized by many of the great guitarists. Um, but we're just going to take a look at kind of how it works. Now, there are some kind of deep technical things that come into play here as we dig in that I'm not going to really, um, I'm not going to go into the full depth of them. If you want to uh, learn more about the really deep technical details, um, I'll put links to a couple of articles down in the description. But in keeping with the spirit of this series of videos, we're going to try and kind of keep things at a, a medium depth as opposed to a really deep depth. So let's jump in. If we take a look at this, um, we'll notice that it's a two transistor design. And we're just going to start at the input of the circuit and kind of work our way through. So on the input, we have a DC blocking capacitor and we have our uh, base resistor coming into our first transistor here. And um, this first transistor, we notice that off of the emitter, it has a very small value resistor here. And this resistor in conjunction with this resistor is going to set the, um, the idle point of our transistor. It's gonna set the amount of gain that we have. Um, and so if, so our signal comes in through here, it's going to come off of the collector, which means it's going to be out of phase with the input. And um, from here, it goes three different directions. The first direction that we're gonna look at is it comes up along through here, where it comes up through a DC blocking capacitor. And on the output of this capacitor, it goes straight to our output jack. So if we were to look at what the output signal is doing or the, the overall signal, it's just going like this to our output, okay? But what's going to end up happening is that this resistor right here, R3, is going to provide um, the change it's going to allow us to change what our input signal actually sounds like. But we'll get to that a little bit later. So we take our signal to the output up through this capacitor C5, but also we have this potentiometer here. This is actually the potentiometer that is tied to the, um, the treadle of the potentiometer. So this is when you're, when you're, pushing the foot pedal up and down, you're changing the resistance of this guy, and it's acting as just a simple volume control that comes to this next transistor stage. And so um, as our signal comes out through here, we're just governing how much of the signal comes through here. Now you'll notice that this is a 100K resistor, which means that we're never going to see more than 100K ohms of resistance here. But our signal also goes to the base of Q2 through this resistor R4, which is 470K. Now, because this is a much larger resistor than this, the signal is actually going to flow up through here. And R4 acts as the bias resistor for the base of Q2. Because what's happening with our power is that we take our nine volt signal, or not our nine volt signal, our nine volt supply rather, and it comes through this resistor, okay? But now it's going to come through, because we have DC here, we don't have any DC blocking caps in this section. 
We have DC blocking caps up here, which means that we're not going to be providing any DC up here. But we do have DC coming through this resistor to the base of our collector. So this is providing the bias to the base of Q2. So we have DC bias coming here, and we have AC signal coming here. Okay? And um, because it's a large resistor, it is setting um, what that bias voltage is going to be based on the amount of current that this guy is going to sink. And a biasing scheme like this is similar to what we've seen in op amps where you don't have a, a DC blocking cap. And so it's a direct, it's a direct bias, okay? Meaning that the bias of our signal here is going to be propagated directly through over to here um, without having a DC blocker and a separate bias supply from our, from our power supply somewhere. Okay, so Q2 has a 1K resistor from nine volts and a 10K resistor to um, to ground off the emitter. And we're going to be pulling the signal off the emitter, which means that as our signal comes onto Q2 like this, it is going to come off the emitter in phase and at unity gain. And it comes down and there's this capacitor right here. This is going to um, block the DC component of our signal, but it's also going to be the whole key to making this circuit work as a as a super sharp notch filter, okay? And we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. So one thing you will have noticed is that up to this point, we haven't talked about any of these components yet, okay? Um, so with these components, this is what these components along with this guy are going to form the resonant behavior of our circuit. So let's start taking a look there. We're going to actually take a quick look at the fact that we, um, you'll notice that there isn't any kind of a resistor that is coming and biasing our base like this. Normally, we would have some kind of a resistor that is providing some amount of voltage from here, the bias for our base is actually being provided through this 1.5K resistor and the parallel combination of these two components, okay? But the thing about an inductor is that an inductor at very, very low frequencies has essentially zero impedance. So at DC, there's not going to be any impedance from this guy, meaning that it's going to completely bypass this resistor. So we have our DC voltage here for the collector, but it's going to come through this 470K ohm resistor, through our inductor, and up through this 1.5K resistor. And because 1.5K is so small compared to 470K, essentially what the collect or the base of this transistor is seeing is the same voltage as over here on the base of this transistor. So we're biasing them, uh, we're, we're biasing them close to the same, except we've got this guy, right? And so this resistor to ground with this resistor R7 forms a voltage divider. So we don't actually see the same bias voltage. We actually see a much lower voltage because this guy is 100K and this is 470K. So we're actually seeing over here a much lower bias voltage. But it, it is still sufficient for us to be able to amplify our signal and to get our effect out, okay? So bias voltage comes down through this resistor, forms a voltage divider with this resistor, doesn't see any DC impedance from this guy, 
comes up through this resistor, which is very small compared to the other resistors, and biases our transistor. So that gives us the bias that we need for our transistor. But now let's look at what ends up happening to give us the resonant behavior. So if we take a look at the fact that we have signal coming here, it's going through a cap, and now we have several different paths that the signal here can take. It can go through the resistor and through the resistor to ground. It can go through the resistor and through the cap to ground. It can go through the inductor and through the resistor to ground, and it can go through the inductor and through the cap to ground. We've got four different paths that that signal can take. Let me erase that. Okay, so if we go through a, if we go through the capacitor, and then if we go through this resistor and this resistor to ground, we are essentially creating a high pass filter, okay? Because we're going through a cap, resistors to ground. And because these guys are just in series, their values just add. So now we can look at the signals that goes through the cap and then through the resistor and through the cap to ground. What we end up seeing here is a, another high pass filter, but this cap is changing the behavior so that it's actually a little bit more kind of band passy. But that doesn't matter to us so much because that's not going to dominate our resonant, uh, our resonant effect of this circuit. What's really going to dominate the, effect, the resonant effect of this circuit is going to be this capacitor and this inductor here. So if we go through this cap and then through the inductor and a resistor to ground, then the signal at this point is going to see a resonant LC circuit where we have C and L, and it's going to be damped, meaning that the Q of the filter is going to be broadened by this resistance here because it's no longer perfect, okay? And there will also be an effect of having a capacitor here and then an inductor and capacitor in series to ground. And what, what ends up happening is that we, we see here a, um, we end up seeing a signal that has a very uh, peaky behavior. It's a very resonant behavior. And that is what the wah is doing, is it is creating that very narrow filter. If you remember from the inductorless wah video, I showed a plot of what the, what the output response of a wah looks like, and it is very peaky. But if we, and so once we have that behavior of a resonant filter here, this R3 also acts as our summing resistor for our transistor because we're putting that signal back on the base to go back through the whole circuit again, okay? Because it's that behavior of feeding back a resonant response that gives us an output that is super peaky. But the interesting thing is that if you remember the resonant frequency of a of an LC circuit is frequently shown as 1 over 2 pi square root LC, okay? Well, our inductance isn't changing, right? There's nothing here that's changing. So how are we getting this frequency to go up and down because we've got a fixed capacitor here and a fixed inductor here? How is it that changing this resistance is actually changing that, um, that, resonant, res that resonant frequency, okay? And the, the way that that works, the reason why it works is because even though the capacitance isn't changing, if we were right here in the circuit and we were looking at the impedance, the complex impedance going this way and this way, 
as we change this potentiometer, we are increasing and decreasing the voltage that's coming into the base, right? Which means we are increasing and decreasing the voltage that is on this side of the capacitor. So even though the capacitance doesn't change, it's complex impedance looking into it this way changes. So what we have, as far as this point in the circuit is concerned, is a variable capacitor. Even though the capacitor isn't changing, the impedance that is presented to this point in the circuit is what is changing, and that creates a change in the frequency response here. Because it's not the inductance and the capacitance that is determining our center frequency, rather it is the complex impedance that those components are presenting. And by nature of changing the voltage on the other side of this capacitor, we're changing the apparent impedance that is seen um, by this point in the circuit of that capacitor. So the, the really big thing to remember is that the way OWA works is that because we're changing the voltage on this side of a capacitor, in an LC circuit, we are changing the resonant frequency of that filter. And as we change the frequency and feed that back into the base, we are changing the overall output response. Now, as I said, we're not going to get really, really deep into this. There um, are, a, in the articles that I linked, there are some good discussion about how it can also be looked at um, in terms of a Miller capacitor um, and also some deeper math into you know how these components are all working together but the the big gist of it is that you have a an input stage here that is providing a small amount of that is providing some amount of gain to the output but then the out the output is also being used in an LC, a resonant LC circuit in the negative feedback loop of this transistor, right? Because this is out of phase with the input and we are taking it, this and this are in phase, which means this point is out of phase with the input of this transistor. So all of these components exist in the negative feedback loop of this transistor, okay? If you want to read more, please look at the links in the description. If you thought the video was helpful, please subscribe so you'll be notified when the next one comes. But until then, take care. Thanks.